Hey, listen, we have been in a series for the last few weeks, and we've been talking about <clears throat> the names of Jesus and the names of God and what they mean to us today. You know, Jesus doesn't just have one name. You know that, don't you? And God doesn't just have one name. He's not just God, amen? He's not just Jesus, amen? There's, there's so many names that Jesus has, over 50 alone names that were given to Jesus in the New Testament. God as well. He has so many names. Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah uh, oh man, I, I, listen, I could go through them and, and I'd get lost. I don't even know all the names of God. But he has so many names. But the thing about those names is they all mean something. They all contain something. Amen? They contain power. Amen? For whatever that may be. Whether that be uh, a Jehovah Shalom. Bringing peace. Amen? God is peace. Jehovah Jireh. He's our provider. Amen? There's so many names of God. But all of those names that God has mean something. They contain something. They are containers of whatever that is, whatever um, um, attribute that, that God has. Amen? Because God is not just God, if you know what I'm saying. He is so much more. Amen? He's your healer. He's your provider. He's the lover of your life. He brings you peace and contentment. He brings joy to you. And so much more. Amen? And that's what we've been talking about for the last few weeks. We're not in a Bible study as such, just for our fun, just to increase our knowledge. I mean, I know there's some weird people out there that love that sort of stuff, just to increase their knowledge, but that's not me, amen? I, I, I don't, when I want to find out about stuff, I want to find out about stuff that means something to me, that I might be able to use at some other stage. So we're not in this whole big quest just to list off all of the names of God and be the smartest person in the room. We want to know what they mean. And what they mean to us, amen? What part we have in it. You know, there's people out there that know so much more about the Bible than I do, or uh, maybe even all of us in here put together, but they don't know Jesus. Yeah. You know, there's people out there that can name every apostle, even the extra ones. They can name all of, uh, they can quote more Bible verses than Jesus himself. They have this amazing biblical knowledge but they don't know jesus there's people that could quote you every verse in the bible you just pick one random verse numbers chapter 2 and verse 6 and they'll tell you just like that what it is but they may not know jesus see we're not talking about jesus and talking about god just to increase our knowledge we're talking about jesus talking about god talking about the names of god because we want to know what those names of God mean to us. Amen? I want to know what the names of God are. Well, I want to know what they mean to us. What benefit there is in me knowing all those names of God. Amen? I watched this guy on, on YouTube. Uh, I watch, I don't know about you, but I don't really watch a whole lot of television now. I'm stuck on YouTube most of the time. That's a good thing or a bad thing, I don't know. But I watched this guy on YouTube who was the foremost expert on the Beatles. Now, I'm not a Beatles fan, but I love watching this guy because he knows everything about the Beatles. And he has everything to do with the Beatles. He has all of the original albums, the original pressings. He has the eight tracks. He has the reel-to-reels. He has the cassettes. He has them all on vinyls, all different versions from all different countries. He knows everything about them. He could tell you who uh, the producer of that song, who wrote that song, which Beatles sang on that song, who played backup on that song. He knows everything to do with the Beatles. He is an absolute expert. But he's never met any of them. He's never met any of the Beatles. I don't know, that'd be difficult now, seeing as there's a couple of them dead, but he's never met any of the living ones either. All of his knowledge of the Beatles is knowledge that he's built up with, with newspaper articles and, and online and research and all of that sort of stuff. And he's learned all of these things about the Beatles, but he's never, ever, ever met one of them. None of his knowledge is experiential knowledge. Amen? He just knows everything about all of these historical characters, the Beatles. You know, to only know Jesus as an historical person is not good enough. Amen? To only know Jesus as a central figure of a religion that you subscribe to, it's not good enough. To only know Jesus as someone that you study and learn about all of his time here on the earth is good, but it's not good enough. 
To know Jesus as your Savior is amazing, but it is not the place to stop. It's a starting point. When we come into a relationship with Jesus and receive Him as our Lord and Savior, that should open the door for us into everything that Jesus came to open up for us, for us to walk in us who believe and trust in Him. Amen? Thank God for salvation. It is the most amazing gift that you will ever receive in your life. But there's more. Amen? There's more. There is so much more to Jesus. Amen? I was thinking about this during the week, and I get some crazy thoughts in my mind. I get brought back to some, some crazy films or some stuff that just, when, I, when I'm going through messages, and just reminds me, and I just thought about Willy Wonka. Anybody a big fan of Willy Wonka? I don't mean the new film, I mean the 70s film. In the 70s film of Willy Wonka, <clears throat> he had these golden tickets, I think five of them, that were in his chocolate bars, and he was a recluse. Nobody had ever got into his factory. So nobody knew what his factory was like, but they knew his chocolate was amazing, and everybody wanted to get into his factory. But nobody ever did. So he'd done these golden tickets, and those people who won the golden tickets could get to go into his factory. And when Willy Wonka came out to invite people into his factory, this very bland, sort of 60s, 50s factory somewhere, I don't know wherever it was, everything looked bland. But when he brought him in, he brought him into this big room with a small door. But when he eventually opened that small door, a whole world opened up in front of him. Now, if you have never seen Willy Wonka, you obviously haven't spent enough time watching Irish television because it's on... Every Christmas, three or four times. And if you haven't, let me recommend to you go see it. But it opened up a whole amazing, crazy world of Willy Wonka. What's that got to do with our message today? Nothing. But I thought it was a nice story that you might like to hear. <laughs> when we pray in Jesus' name, we pray in a powerful name, don't we? Jesus' name is powerful. But why don't I pray in Elon Musk's name? He's a powerful guy. He's the richest man in the world. We're hundreds of billions, so why don't I pray in his name? Or maybe why don't I pray in the Pope's name? He's got so much followers. He's got so much authority here on the earth, so why don't I pray in his name? And actual fact, why don't I pray in my own name? Surely I'm the most important person in my life. I'm the one who makes the decision of when I get out of bed in the morning. I'm the decision of when I, to decide who, when I get into the bed. I'm the one who decides what I'm going to eat. So why don't I pray in my name? Why don't I pray in the president's name? He's a powerful guy. You know why I don't pray in Elon Musk's name, despite the fact he's the most richest person in the world, or the Pope's name, because he's the most influential uh, person, or one of the most influential persons in the world, carrying a lot of authority on the earth? Why don't I pray in the president's name, or my own name? You know why I don't? Because we're all powerless. Amen. None of our names contain any power. Oh, I might think I have power, but I don't. Amen. Elon Musk might think he's powerful, but he's not. Amen. Just ask Steve Jobs, one of the other richest persons in the world a number of years ago who couldn't stop cancer in his life. He's died. How powerful was he? Money doesn't bring you power. A lot of followers don't make you powerful. Being the president or a prime minister of a country doesn't make you powerful. Amen? When we pray, we pray in the most powerful name. The name that created the universes. Jesus' name. Amen? The most powerful name. I am powerless. Amen? Even if you're called Rambo, Strongbow, or Terminator... None of those names carry power. Amen? Jesus' name. That's different. Jesus' name is powerful. It contains power. It's, if you like, it's a fully loaded name. Amen? Remember the time when the posse from the high priest's house came to arrest Jesus in the garden just before his crucifixion? In John 18 and verse 3, it says, Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops, and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees came with the lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that will come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? 
they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Now when he said, I am he, they drew back and they fell to the ground. When Jesus said, I am he, he wasn't just saying he was the one that they were looking for. He was actually saying, I am he. I am he. Remember that time when Jesus was being questioned by the Jews? And, they, and when he was answering him, he said this to him in John 8, verse 58. He said, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. You know what Jesus was saying there when he said, I am he? He was saying, I am God. I am God. That's what he was saying. And this declaration of his lordship caused such offense to the Jews that they tried to kill him. So in the garden, when Jesus answered and when they came asking for Jesus of Nazareth, and Jesus said, I am he. He wasn't saying that he was Jesus of Nazareth per se. He was saying, I am God. And that declaration contains so much power that all of those who came out to arrest him, they were blown to the ground. They collapsed. The strength in their bodies left them. And you know me. I'm the sort of person that when I read stuff like that, I, 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 I put myself there in the situation. And I'm looking at this situation through my mind's eye. And I'm seeing these people looking for Jesus and it's kind of like a whole shock wave hit them. And the strength of their bodies collapsed out of them. And in my imagination, I, I'm looking at this situation and I'm seeing Jesus standing there going, when is it ready? As he just stood there and they were all out in the ground and whenever, you know. Verse 7 says, and then he asked them again after they getting up, waking up, shaking up, whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said, I've told you that I am he. The name or the names of Jesus and God, they contain power. And that's what we've been looking at these last couple of weeks. And just for a few minutes today, I want to talk to you about another name of God, and that is Jehovah Nisi. Literally translated, it says, the Lord is my banner. Or he fights my battles. Church, Jehovah Nisi fights your battles. Your father, he fights your battles. Amen? Amen. Our God, the God we worship, the God we follow, the God we love, when there seems to be no way, He will make a way. No matter what you're going through today, no matter what you come up against this year, no matter what Red Sea stands in your way this year, no matter what army surrounds you this year, no matter what weapon is formed against you this year, and there will be many, or what storm tries to drown you this year, I want you to know in all of that, that God will make a way. Amen? He is your Jehovah Nisi. Isaiah 43, 19 says, See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the desert or the wasteland. Church, if it is in your way, God will either take it away or He will make a way. Amen? God is not afraid of anything that can be formed against you. Anything that you come up against, God is not, he is not uh, uh, intimidated by it. Amen? He is the God who makes a way. He is Jehovah Nisi. Amen? That name there, Jehovah Nisi, comes to us during a time when God's people are in a battle. In Exodus chapter 17 and verse 8, it says, Now Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. Now the Amalekites, or a group of people, they were descendants of Amalek, and they were the grandsons of Esau's Isaac's son. And just like 
Esau and Jacob fought, the grandchildren were fighting too. And in this story that we're reading today, the, the Amalekites were coming against God's people, looking to destroy them. That sounds familiar to anybody today. Isn't it so true that our enemy is still coming against us today, trying to destroy us even still today? Jehovah Nisi means the Lord is our banner. A banner used in the Word of God is, is something that would lead out God's people as they were going into battle. They would lead out God's people under God's flag. I was just, I have all of these notes written on this there today, and I just, when I went down to Dane just before church started, as Dane is doing the PowerPoints this morning, I just said to him, Dane, it's like that time when you were doing that stuff in, in Vikings. Dane worked on the scene, uh, uh, on, on the film set for Vikings, a new series, I think it's coming out next year, this year, maybe. But I said to Dane, yeah, it's, it's that whole thing there, you know, when, when you're going out to battle where you have one person in the front carrying a flag. A little bit like this guy here. He carries the flag. He goes out before the, the both armies carrying the flag. Now, it's not a job I put my hand up for. Give me a machine gun any day rather than a flag. Because inevitably, the guy carrying the flag gets shot or stabbed or whatever. He, gets, he dies. Amen? Because he's just carrying the flag. And what amazes me every time is that once he gets killed, someone else runs to pick up the flag. <laughs> Praise God. But it was an honor to carry the flag. Whether it be the flag of your nation in the Olympics, we still do it today. When they parade all the teams, someone carries the flag as a nation. What is it saying? It's saying that this flag represents this nation, these people. Jehovah Nisi is our banner. He is our flag bearer. Amen. And we, when we fight, we fight underneath his flag. Amen. The flags that lead you out is to signify whose you are and whom you're fighting for and whose covering you come underneath. Verse 9 says, And Moses said to Joshua, Choose us some men to go out and go out and fight with Amalek tomorrow. I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him, and he fought with Amalek. And Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. When you go through battles in life, sometimes you're winning, and sometimes it feels like you're losing, doesn't it? And it's right there in the middle of that battle is when we're to learn who our Jehovah Nisi is to us. Because it's right there that we will learn how to fight our battles. Moses said to Joshua, he said, you go down and fight the battle with the weapons of warfare, but I'm going up there on the top of that hill over there, and I'm going to hold up the rod of God. The same rod that Moses opened up the Red Sea with, the same rod that brought water out of a rock. The same rod that used to be called the rod of Moses. You know that? God told Moses over there in Exodus chapter 4 and verse 2, God told Moses to throw it down. God said to him, he said, what's that in your hand? Moses said it was a rod. God said to him, cast it to the ground. And when Moses picked up that rod after he cast it into the ground, it became the rod of God. Verse 20 says, And then Moses took his wife and his sons and set them on a donkey, and he returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the rod of God in his hand. You see, when Moses turned over what God had given him back to God, it became a tool that God could now use, and not just a tool that Moses possessed. So Joshua, he went into battle. But Moses went up onto the hill with Aaron and her. And Moses, he held up the rod. And in verse 11 says, And so it was when Moses held up his hands that Israel prevailed. But when he let his hands down, Amalek prevailed. You know well as I do, when you hold up your hands for a long time, they get tired. 
You can't hold your hands up for much more than a couple of minutes, but they get tired. And this is what happened to Moses. As he held up his hands, they were winning the battle. But as his hands got tired and as he lowered his arms, they, they started to lose the battle. So watch this. What was happening there on the ground in the battle with the enemy wasn't really being determined by how well Joshua and Israel's army was fighting. What was happening in the battle there on the ground was being determined by what was happening up on the hill with Moses. You all with me? When the rod of God was up, they were winning. But when the rod of God was down, they were being defeated. You know, one of the reasons we end up losing our battles is because when we fight in the valley with no rod up on the hill. Amen? I'm going to explain that to you. We do all of our fighting in the valley, but we don't have the rod up on the hill. It says, as Moses held up the rod, they were winning, but as he lowered the rod, they were being defeated. Why? Because the rod on the hill was an appeal to heaven to intervene in the battle in the valley. Church, the biggest problem that we have is that when we spend more of our time fighting in the battle than we do appealing on the hill. We spend more time fighting than we do praying. Amen? And it's what we do up there, up on the hill, that will determine what happens down here in the battle. We need to pray. When a battle, a struggle, a fight comes your way, don't automatically go looking for whatever weapons you can, whatever armory you can get. Maybe that's the time that you head up onto the hill and start praying. Amen? Because the victory that's won in the valley will be determined by the prayers that's given up on the hill. This is really important. If you spend more time focused on the things that you are fighting than the God that you are appealing to, don't be shocked that the battle that you're fighting doesn't go your way. But if you have a greater focus on Jehovah Nisi while still standing in the battle, you will find that your, your Amalekites, your enemies, they will succumb because Jehovah Jireh has been invited into the battle. See, that's the mistake we make a lot of times. We fight the battles against the enemy, but we don't invite Jehovah Nisi into the battle. Amen? We need to bring God into the battle. Amen? In the story, in the... The people in the valley were very dependent on the people on the mountain. When Moses held up the rod, they were winning the battle, but when he lowered it, they were losing. They'd be fighting away. Happy out. Winning. And five minutes later, they're, they're being defeated. And they're like, we're not doing anything different. What's happening? You know Why? Because something had changed on the mountain. This is why they were losing. That's why I love what happened next in verse 12. It says, but Moses' hands became weary or he got tired. It happens, doesn't it? It happens. When we're in the middle of a battle, when we're going through struggles in life, when it seems like the whole world is against us, we get tired. We get tired of the battle. We get tired of the fight. It's not easy, is it? We've got to fight against the tiredness, though, don't we? Galatians 6, 9 tells us that we are not to grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. But when we're constantly fighting the same battle, we get tired and our hands get heavy. You don't want to pray anymore. You don't want to worship anymore. You don't want to read God's Word anymore because you're tired. But verse 12 tells us that when Moses' hands got heavy, watch what he did. And they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. 
So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Church, the truth is you are going to get tired. That's just, let's get that out there. Everyone gets tired. Even the greatest worshiper, the greatest prayers, the greatest people connected to God or whatever you want to call them, they get tired. We all get tired. That's where the church comes in. Amen? That's where the body of Christ comes in. You are going to need Aaron's and hers in your life. Every day. In the battle and in the peacetime. You're still going to need your errands and your hers, amen, to hold you up and support you when you're going through the battle. Amen? God didn't create you to go through this life on your own. Amen. He put people in your life that will stand with you, that will stand beside you, that will stand for you, and people that will hold up your arms when you are just too tired to hold them up for you. People who will pray with you and pray for you. Church, we have to surround ourselves with people who believe in and trust in God that will stand with us. People that will keep believing God for you even when things are looking bad, when you're going through the heat of battle. Because here's the thing. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12 tells us that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Our battle is not a physical battle, but it's a spiritual battle that manifests itself in our lives as visible and physical struggles. Well, here's the thing. If you want to deal with the visible and the physical down here, you must address the invisible and the spiritual Jehovah Nisi up there. Amen? Amen? Paul tells us again in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6. It says, And raised us up together and made us sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Church, our battles are on earth, but we do our battles from heaven. Amen? We can spend all of our lives struggling and fighting and constantly being in conflict constantly going through hard times, tough times. We can do that. But let me tell you, they are not going to go away on their own. The only time, that, the only way that they will go away when we, do, when we do our battle and when we do our praying up on the hill, bring Jehovah Nisi into our struggles. Amen? Now, I know you're looking at me and you're thinking to yourself, you know, I, I don't really totally understand what he's saying. How can I fight a battle here on the earth, but at the same time be fighting a battle up in, up in heaven? How, I can't be in two places at one time. Well, if one thing the pandemic has taught us, that through modern technology is possible for you to be sitting at your kitchen table in your suit and pajamas <laughs> and be in a meeting with someone on the far side of the world. Amen? So you're physically in your kitchen, but you're also in New York or, I don't know, wherever else you may be, New Ross or wherever you may be doing your, your Zoom call. Amen? You haven't moved location, but you have transferred to a different realm, yeah? God says if you want to transfer the battles that you fight on earth to the God in heaven, because God in heaven is bigger than whoever you're fighting here on the earth. Amen? God wants you to give it to him. Amen? Give it to him. Why would you hold it back from God? Why would you see another battle coming down the road for yourself, another enemy, another issue coming down the road, and just go, oh, here we go again. Roll up your sleeves. And... No. Why would you not first, before you try and enter into a physical battle, Drop on your knees and then invoke Jehovah Nisi. Talk to your God in heaven and ask him to intervene. Why wouldn't you talk to those two people that you trust in church that have your back, that will pray for you, that will pray with you, that will stand with you? Why wouldn't you go to them and say, hey, listen, I see this battle coming down the road for me. Will you pray with me? Will you stand with me? 
Will you be my Aaron? Will you be my Hur? Will you hold up my arms? Because I am so tired of this battle. Why would we try and go through these things on our own when God has put people in our lives that will stand with us? Amen? God is our Jehovah Nisi. He is our banner that we fight under. Amen? Verse 14 says, The Lord said to Moses, Write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalekite from under the heavens. And Moses, he built an altar there and called its name, The Lord is my banner. The Lord is our Jehovah Nisi. Do we have any WWE or WWF or whatever you want to call it, fans in house, more wrestling fans? Okay, I know, you, you might be a little bit embarrassed, so you don't need to put up your hand, that's okay. And I'm not trying to say that they're not real. The bruises that those guys get are very real. The injuries that they get are very real. The blood that they spill is very real. I mean, there's no way you can hit someone over the back with a table without it hurting. So they are very real. Someone throws a chair at you, they are not plastic or they are not spongy. They are real. They hurt. But the thing about wrestling is, even though it is real fighting, the result of the fight has already been determined before they get into the ring. But they have to go through all of their motions, all of their moves, and climbing onto the side of the ring, jumping off. The, they have to go through all of their motions before the referee finally declares a winner. But before those guys leave their dressing room, they know who's going to win the fight. Amen? But they have to go through their routines anyway. I want you to know that when you serve God, when you believe in God, and when you invoke God, and when you trust Jehovah Nisi in all of your battles, I need you to know before you go into any battle, no matter what it may be, whether it be a health battle, whether it be a relationship battle, whether it be any kind of battle that you go through, whether it be financial, no matter what it is, the result has already been determined. Amen? And you may have to go struggle a bit. You may have to fight a little bit. But if you trust God, and if you do most of your fighting up there on that hill, trusting God with your arms outstretched to Him, believing in Him, fighting underneath His banner, Jehovah Nisi, you will have the victory. The victory has already been determined. Yeah. Amen? Amen? We are already victorious. We've been declared victorious. God has said that we are more than conquerors. Yeah. Amen? He has given us the victory. Now you might ask yourself the question, what can be more than a conqueror? How can I be more than a conqueror? What does that mean? What's that all about? Easiest example I can give to you of someone that's more than a conqueror. You imagine, everybody see the Rocky films? Come on, you've seen the Rocky films. You know who I'm talking about, Sylvester Stallone and Adrian. Remember Adrian and his wife? Well, what would, what would Sylvester Stallone do? Rocky. Rocky would train for months. Train for months for one fight. And he'd be in tip-top condition, but I mean to tell you, he'd have gone through it to get to there. And he would climb into the ring for fighting Ivan Drago or Mr. T, I don't know what he was calling it, fighting these guys. And he'd get knocked around the ring for 13 rounds. I mean knocked around the ring. He would be bleeding from every orifice in his body. He would be broke up. His eyes would be closed. Famous line, cut me Adrian, because he couldn't see out through his eyes. I mean, he was in bits. Knocked to the ground more times than I don't know what. And still... He would fight away. And eventually, eventually, in the final round, he would eventually land that sucker punch that dropped his opponent. Bell would ring. They'd come out and give him the belt. He'd hold, barely hold the belt up. And then he'd go home after the fight. And in his back pocket, he'd have over his shoulder, he'd have his belt. World champion. But in his back pocket, he'd have a check for the purse, for whatever it be, a couple of million or whatever. And he walked back into his home, struggle, maybe pushed into his home in a wheelchair, I don't know. And he would see his wife, Adrienne, standing there by the kitchen sink. And he'd walk up to Adrienne, bruised and battered, and he'd take that check out of his pocket, and he'd hand it to her. That's what it is to be more than a conqueror. 
she didn't have to train. She didn't have to fight. She didn't have to show up. She didn't have to get into the ring and face Mr. T. She didn't have to go through all of that. She didn't have to get Adrian to cut her. But yet she got the spoils. Amen? Yet she got the spoils of it. That's what it is to be more than a conqueror. And that's what God said we are. We are more than a conqueror. We didn't have to go through life on this earth facing the Romans every day, facing all of what the Pharisees and, and all of those people brought to Jesus every day. We didn't have to go through the hardships of being arrested and whipped and beaten and battered and nailed to a cross. Jesus did. But when he came down off of that cross and when he was resurrected, he gave us the victory. Yeah. Amen? We are more than conquerors. Amen? If we believe in and trust in Jehovah Nisi. Amen? Romans chapter 8 and verse 37. In all of these things, you are more than conquerors to him who loves us. I don't know what Amalek is trying to do to you today. But I want you to know and I want you to place yourself underneath the banner of God. Underneath Jehovah Nisi. Amen? And if you do that, the result is already decided. The victory has already been declared. God is your Jehovah Nisi. He is your victory. Amen?